And uh, we will resume the last couple of presentations for this session. And I'll hand over to Heather. Thanks, William. Um, right. So I was invited today to talk about research outfits, uh, social in innovation and engagement, and how they all fit together. So there's a, a bit of a diagram of how I think they fit together. And we'll go through that in more detail. But first of all, a little bit of an aside. Let me just see how this works. Ah, yes. Um, I just want to tell you about who I am and where I come from. Um, so my name's Heather Ray. I'm the project manager of the Edinburgh Beltane Beacon for Public Engagement. And we're that little cloud there in the um, multicolored cloud on the, on the image there. Um, we're one of six beacons for public engagement. Um, we're in our third year, uh, three out of four years. Um, and we're funded by the Research Councils UK, the Wellcome Trust, and in our case, the Scottish Funding Council. Um, so we have beacons all over the... the um, UK. Um, they're not regional beacons. They're actually each a different experiment in culture change. We each have the remit of embedding a culture of public engagement in higher education institutions in our particular partnership. Um, and we all have a different approach, but we all talk to each other. Um, and, and we also work with the National Coordinating Centre, which is based in Bristol, um, to talk about public engagement, how we can encourage it, how we can support it within in institutions, um, and, how it can, and it f how it can fit with um, institutions' remit. Um, our partnership is one of the larger ones. Academically, we've got, well, now we're down to five partners because ECA is part of um, the University of Edinburgh, but we've got all the, basically all the HEIs in Edinburgh and UHI for good measure um, as our partners. And we're supposed to try and change culture in all of those places. And they all have different cultures, and it's great fun. Um, so, and how we've gone about doing that is, is as I say, doing lots of different things about <clears throat> just generating discussion, um, providing support, um, providing some resources uh, through our websites, and creating a network, if you like, of people to support each other to do engagement. Because the reason that we got the funding was there's actually a lot of engagement going on. Um, in our institutions, but they're doing it, basically it's happening despite the system, and we want to make the system encourage it. So, oh, right, sorry. Next. So back to our, our the main um, thing that I'm supposed to talk about um, these research outputs. So I want to just clarify what I understand to be research outputs, because excuse my ignorance, I've, I've not been in your community for too long, but. Uh, it, they can be seen as, by some people, as the papers, the journal papers that have been um, put out, but I also see it as the analysis that's generated um, through graphs, the data behind that, but also the side products, the byproducts, if you like, um, perhaps the digitization of artifacts um, or the creation of digital um, things, either uh, engineering digit, um, aspects or... Um, even artistic um, stuff. So that's another point, is that my remit covers all uh, disciplines, not just, some people consider it, think it might just be sciences and um, technology, but in fact, we're concerned with the public engagement of all research that is being done within our institutions. So <clears throat> the other thing is that um, one of the things that I have a concern about, and I'm not sure that's true, but it sounds a little bit like what a lot of people think of as the audience for these things are other researchers. And that um, is of definitely one audience for it. But I can see a wider grouping of people that could benefit from these um, outputs. Um, just simply, um, it could be school teachers who need um, material for, for their, their curriculum, to develop curriculums, to bring curriculums up to date. Um, it could be patients looking for information on analysis and seeing if the actual data is relevant to them. Uh, it could be charities or um, NGOs who want to build a case for their next initiative. And that's really what I'm talking about when I'm thinking about social innovation. When you talk about social innovation, it's something that is done that 
benefit society. So it could be something that leads to better housing or transport. It could lead to better education, better education opportunities, a higher standard of living. Um, there's something in there I didn't have in there about culture as well. <clears throat> Less expensive or better health care, a healthier population, both mentally and physically, and promoting of sustainable living practices that benefits us all. Um, it could also be more globally. It could be um, uh, working with... Uh, third world countries and, and the like to, to develop all those things as well, as well as locally. So how does that happen? How do you get data to create that, ha that, that change or those benefits? Well, at the highest level, you can think of it as being policy changes, but policy changes based on evidence that that, that data produces. Or it could be communities of practice picking up on the evidence and starting to use that. <clears throat> um, so for examples, teachers teaching in a different way because of something that a researcher has, has pointed out. It could be um, NGOs or charities developing pilot events, activities, or initiatives based on research, um, or using the research as evidence to fundraise. Or it could be um, creating, used to create a culture change through, for giving people arguments for creating that change. So these are just some of the things that can be done. But again, in order for these to happen, there has to be this thing called engagement. People have to know about that research in order for them to pick up and use it. Um, and what I want to do is spend a little bit of time thinking about what we mean by engagement. And to tell you the truth, I spent the last three years thinking about this quite a lot. Um, <clears throat> and I've picked, developed this model. It's, it's based on um, a, a large field of work in public participation in, um, uh, that has gone on, so it's really quite developed. And they have this concept of a spectrum of engagement um, from simply, at one end, informing people about what you do, all the way into involving people into decision-making, um, delegating, giving them the power to make those decisions. <clears throat> and then in between, there's steps of consulting and involving people. And so I've, I've done that, and I've done a couple of things. I've taken that spectrum and changed it in a couple of ways. I've done a bit of a mapping along the bottom of examples of um, what academics might do on that spectrum. They might write books. That's informing people what they do. They might give public lectures. They might create interactive exhibits. That's sort of more getting people involved in, in, in their own learning, if you like. Or, um, and also <coughs> the people can... Um, feedback into the research. They can do public debates, policy forums, and get involved in citizen juries. But that's just one set of examples. There's a lot of, there's a whole raft of other things that can be done. The other thing I've done is I've made it this kind of wedge. Um, because some people tend to think that the shorter end of the wedge is the most important work. And yes, um, in some ways, getting people involved in decision making or running their lives is, is a a really valuable um, outcome. However, not everybody has a time to be involved in every decision that's made. Um, and the actual cost um, to do that is huge. So if you like the, the fixed cost, the value return is, is lower at that end for what you put in. Whereas the other thing is that in order to create that at that end of the wedge, you actually have to do everything beforehand. You have to inform people, you have to consult people, you have to involve people, and then they can start making decisions. So it's important that there's a lot of this informing going on. So when I was asked to do this talk, I had a little bit of a think about where this concept of, well, I've put it on as accessible data, but open data or open scholarship might fit on this spectrum. And I don't think it is exactly engagement as such, but it really underpins a certain part of the engagement, and I really think it's, it's there within the consulting and involving. If your data is free for people to interact with, to use, <clears throat> um, if it's not there for them to interact with the use, you're not involving them in your research, if you like. So that's, that's kind of where I'm, my thinking is at at the moment, but um, please do tell me if I'm wrong or if you have other thoughts. <coughs> so how does this engagement work? Well, we also have this thing where we think of people as, we talk about public engagement. Um, and we think, what is the public? 
The public is the general public. No, um, that's, that's, that's very, um, if you like, not the right way to think about it. If you want to think about it, really, it's, it's groups of publics. It's people with special interests in your work. So, for instance, you might want to think about policymakers if you're wanting to make that big impact. But then you have to think about what kind of policymaker. Are they at EU level, UK level? Are they at Scottish level or local? Are they local council or institutional? Who's going to use that policy? Does it have to be way at the top? Does it have to be a directive from the EU? Or can it just be an institution like a, a university saying, right, we're going to change our language policy because <clears throat> of the research that this person has done? Um, the other thing to think about with policymakers is that really their life, they make decisions, their life is about making decisions, and they make a lot of decisions every day. So they just have to do it, if you like, just in time. So messages, messages for them have to be really clear, but per perhaps underpinned by the research outputs. Okay, moving along swiftly. Um, another, another public you might think of is, if you like, a community worker who are p potentially... Um, basically communities of practice, people who work, um, who will share their, their ideas and, and how they do things. Um, and then I have something here about funders because they're going, if you're wanting to reach these people, they're going to be looking to the funders. Um, potentially you want to look at the channels that the funders use um, <coughs> to, to reach these people to get your message out there. And I also have Twitter as a potential uh, social media, an example of social media as a means of reaching these people. I can give an example of that, but I've shortened time, so I'll go on. Um, also, you, you might go down to the individual. In this case, I'm uh, an example of a patient. And how can you reach the, them with your reach, research output? Or um, it's where they are. They, those people populate doctor's offices and hospitals. They have support, community support groups. There are particular online forum, forums and searches that are, are targeted at them. So what I'm trying to say with this is, if you want to reach different people to, who might access and make benefit from your research or the research that's there, you have to think about the audiences and how you might actually reach them. <clears throat> and just to give a, uh, bring this whole thing into a broader perspective, is w with the National Coordinating Centre, we have done some work um, in defining uh, how public engagement is seen in REF impact. And what we've come up with is basically engagement is an impact. Engagement is a pathway to impact. It's something that you're doing um, that will increase, has the potential to increase um, the impact, but is not evidence of impact. But it's very important for us to, to, tell, to explain to researchers that when they develop their research funding grant applications, that they need to, do, to think about this in their pathways to impact. Um, <clears throat> another thing, um, working with the, uh, as a group of six, we've been able to sort of turn to the funders and say, hey, you want us to change culture down here, but actually you guys need to change culture too. And they have done that. Um, so they responded by creating a concordat for engagement with the public, of the public with research. And um, so that's a, a very broad guideline for <clears throat> institutions uh, that funders have signed up to to say that what they expect the institutions to do is to support the researchers to engage. And in response to that, the National Coordinating Centre have drafted a manifesto called the Engaged University. And I'm pleased to say that three out of our four um, partners have signed up to that so far. We're getting, working on the fourth one. Um, and uh, which broadly says that the institution will look at its support for engagement um, and then try to develop that over the next coming year. Right. <clears throat> so finally, my call to action to you is um, come to our conference, it's particularly if you're a Scottish researcher or um, working in Scottish um, academic institution. We've gone, we've de for our final year, we've decided to hold a uh, Scottish-wide conference looking at <clears throat> engagement, um, looking at training and development networks and partnerships, quality and evaluation, and having some open spaces um, to, to think about how Scottish universities can become more engaged. Also, um, you can have a look at our, our website, 
edinburghbeltane.net to see what opportunities and things that uh, we can offer you as well. So that's my talk. Thank you very much, Heather. That was uh, perfect timing, and uh, that looks like a really interesting conference. So there you go. I hope somebody's tweeting some of that.